should probably turn this back on again. The uh, example that we're going to look at here is looking at Australian firearms legislation. Basically, what we're looking at is from year 1915 until a little bit closer to today, we're looking at how many suicides are there made with firearms, how many homicides are there by firearms, suicide by other means, and homicides by other means. That's basically the data set. And then it's normalized per, I think, per 10,000 or per whatever. I forgot that number. Um, it's not so important for the modeling. It's just to say it's OK to have decimal points here. So it's something per, cap, per x capita. And then the last here is saying, at some point, there is a legislation that is being changed, and then which will make some of the zeros here turn into ones. It was 1997. It was effective. And as we just discussed here, with, in order to have something be effective in one, you may need to actually place it one step before. And then the last column is how many years has this been effective. And we have observations up to and including 2004, and we're going to predict the following years. This, initially, this was actually a study that was made by someone different. And what they did was to estimate for each of the four kinds of killing. They looked at how, um, they just look at fitting an armor model to each of them. So what they did was to fit a, an armor 1,1 one one model. And I think the reference yeah, is here, Baker and McFerrin. Um, they fitted an armor model, so we'll start doing the same thing. It's always good to be able to repeat what someone else has done before you start doing something new. Um, if you cannot repeat it, there may be an error somewhere that you want to fix before adding on from there. The data, actually, this is one of the places where this code won't run, but I'll share the code that I'm running um, afterwards. So, and most of this in the package, in the help file for the package, you will find these examples are the same examples that are used there. Um, find, fit an armor, one common one model. We'll use the define that model function. And then you have some arguments here. And I think. This is the reason why I brought the two screens up. The data are now called just Austra. So the define that model, what it actually does is to say how many, what is k? What is the dimension of the data that we have? Well, we have seven variables. We're not going to use all of them, but we have a matrix with seven variables. So we have to give the dimension of the matrix. What is the lags that we want to have in the AR and MA part? We just specify lag one and lag one. And then we say we will at first remove variable the year and the legislation and the legislation time. And then we'll say that it should treat variables two through five as independent. That means we're not going to do any out of, we're only going to look at parameters in the diagonal in these parameter matrices that we will get in a moment. So what we get out here is an AR pattern that contains first the identity matrix, as always, and then it contains ones in those places where we actually want to have measurements making, uh, estimates made. So what we have here are four ones to say, I want an AR1 parameter for Y2, Y3, Y4, and Y5. I don't want any interaction between them because I said I wanted them to be independent. And if I scroll further down, 
I have the same structure for the moving average part. But the overall, the first element here is a full identity matrix. Even though we say we're going to ignore the first and the sixth and the seventh, it will just have all those in there. That's a choice. Sometimes it's irritating, other times it's nice because everything has the same structure when you get out. When you start adding other effects, actually, I mean, it's already prepared for that, so it's not a problem. So, right now, it's a little bit, why, do we only, why not just have a 4x4 four four matrix? I could do that if I wanted to just give these four variables as argument, but I will throughout use all the data as argument. So I have here organized the way that Marima wants it, that I get the year in the first row, and then the different kinds of suicide and homicides, and then the legislation effect in the end. So then I give that I want to estimate mean values for each of the parameters. I take the AR pattern that I just gave up here in define.model, I take the MA pattern, I prepared this for a little bit wider screen, as it was given above. But we could ask it to check. Uh, and then I will make a plot that is not given, if you look at what is over here, that's one of the things I've changed. Here says plot equals false. It should say no now within the current, but I won't have any uh, penalty either. So if I just estimate this, it will run true. The checking here is basically just looking at all the data, are things the way that we want it to be. Um, so what is this plot over here? The logarithm of the determinant of the residual covariance matrix. Mentioning that, remember that I mentioned this is doing a linear regression model. The linear regression model, well, you cannot do an armor model as a linear regression model. You can do a pure AR as a linear regression model, but not with the moving average part. So you need to do an iterative algorithm where you say, give an initial guess, then you estimate something, and then based on that, you update and Im improve. And that's what's written in the original paper, but it also means that what you should check is that this algorithm did it actually converge. And the most informative part is to look at the residual covariance matrix. It's okay if it goes up and down again. What we want to look at is just that it's stationary for the last bit over here. That is what's telling us that it's actually converged. We'll get when we start using penalty, it will look quite different from what is there right now, but we still want to see it convert at the end. Now, to look at what comes out, Henrik made a function called short form, which is basically just saying, I don't want to see the leading unity matrix. I just want to see what I care about, namely the coefficients. So in the lag one for the AR, I have these four estimated parameters here. So that is basically, and if you compare with the original and compare with doing univariate models, those are the same values that you get, except for rounding errors. Same thing for the moving average part, it's the same thing. If we want to do it as a multivariate model instead, we define dot model, our model two, with the same AR and MA, we want an one comma one model. We will still remove variables one, six, and seven, but there will be none that are supposed to be treated as independent. But we could still treat one of them as independent if you really wanted to, but now we'll just try to estimate where rather than having just diagonal elements here for the MA and AR, we will estimate a four by four matrix in here, which you can see that 
if we look at this model here, now just looking at the MA part, you have a 4x4 matrix indicating with ones where you want to have estimates made. And if I just run the same model, you first you just look, well, did we actually converge? Yeah, from around iteration 25 and onwards, it really didn't change much. So it did actually converge nicely. Uh, here's one of the cases where poof, it got up a little bit, but it's not. It's just that it's converging. That is what we want to look at. And if you look at the estimates, well, we have, you can see, <laughs> the expected 4 by 4 AR part here and similar for the MA part. I won't discuss the particular values because they're not so meaningful for us right now because we're just using this as an example. But just to say what we do with the model definition is just to say where do we actually want to have parameters. Now, there are two choices for what to do next. In the example, what's the next is to just go through the um, What they added in the example was also to um, <coughs> look at how much do I actually, that was the wrong one. Uh, where was it? Two, 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 one, 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 two. So what they looked at in the example was if you go through the code there, also look at what is actually the covariance matrix that you get out. And you can say, well, you're just looking at those numbers, how to kind of compare them with anything. What you could do would be to look at what is the covariance of the residual covariance matrix and what is the diagonal element of the data covariance, so for the variance of the original data. So this is kind of an R squared estimate. So we explain quite a bit of the variation in at least some of them, but not all of them. Now we go, these are the data uh, as full drawn line and then the predictions, do I remember right? It says uh, the data are the lines and the predictions are the circles, exactly. Um, so it looks like we are sort of following the data. Um, but how do we say which one is, be is better? Here we get to the second model. Ah, and then there's a page break just where I want to stay. So what one way of comparing two models is to look at the residual covariance matrix for the two models. So you have the second model divided by the first model and look at the diagonal elements there. What happens there? Then we get those numbers up there. So how should I interpret those numbers? Well, if you get a 1, it means that there was no reduction. So for the fifth variable, there was no reduction. Homicides by other means was not described any better by doing a multivariate model. We'll keep that in mind. Whereas the other three variables were somewhere between 11 and 16 percent better than what was actually there before. And if we do the same prediction plot as before, I will include this for the last model, but I just didn't want to put all that code in my sample code. Um, again, it's kind of hard to look at this, at least unless you're very, very close to it and see what is actually happening, but we see that it actually follows the data reasonably well, but we also saw that we actually it improved because the covariance matrix of the residuals was smaller. I'll skip that one. Um, now, if we are looking at this model, we should also kind of look at how good is it. 
but I will not do too much about this, except right now I'll just say that, well, you want to look at how the data is, you want to look at the residuals, you want to look at the autocollation and the partial autocollation of those residuals to see, did we actually good, make a good job? So those are the same thing for a multivariate model, you just have to do it for each of the variables. And here, well, we see that everything looks quite nice from this perspective, at least. And then as a next step in the model, what we're going to do is to use model tree. All this up here is the same. And then the only difference is that rather than removing variables six and seven, we'll use them as regression variables. So if you just run this and look at what we get out, then for the AR pattern, we get the, oops, the four by four matrix from before. And then as regression variables, we get two columns of ones out there representing the sixth and seventh variable. When we go down to the MA part, we have the same dependence on the noise as before. So the only place where we see a difference is that now we, in the AR part, we pad with the regression variables because that is effectively, it will be more clear when we estimate the parameters, what it is that we do. So I'll just fit the model. The only difference to before was that now all data has the last rows included where we have the legislation effect before I stopped early on in the data set. I Again, we see that it does converge. So as such, we're happy. If we look at the AR coefficients here, well, again, we get some different values in here. And then we get those out here. So this is how it does the output depend on variable six and variable seven. But there's nothing here in the bottom part. There's no model for variable six and seven because we're just treating them as predictors of regression variables. So we should not make a model trying to figure out how are they actually behaving down there. Oops. And for the moving areas part, well, we get the same structure of variables as before. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if you fit a model like this, how many parameters do we actually fit? Have you thought of that? Probably haven't, I haven't said it. How many, how many parameters did we fit in this model here right now? Nope. Why 56? 56 plus what, where does the 20 come from? Then you have uh, 4, 5, 4 in that one, and then in the regressive you have 4 by, four by six. Yes, so I have 4 by 4 and 4 by 6. Okay. So that So I have 16 plus 24, 24 which becomes 40. And then I estimate some mean values, yeah. four of those, one for each of the four series. Actually, it does estimate for the other three as well, but I'll ignore that. Then it estimates the covariance matrix for the residuals, but we cannot treat that as an extra thing that is estimated after the fact. So these are the parameters that we estimate when you think of how large a model do we have. So what is the likelihood that all 40 parameters are actually significant? Probably slim. <laughs> so what we'll do is that we'll use 
the same model structure as before. I just copied the script, so therefore it is defined as a new variable. And then I will take the data as before. This is only to get the right rows out. And then I will include a penalty. First, I will include a penalty of 1, as is suggested. I prefer to use a different value. Now the convergence plot looks quite different. Right? And you are, with this particular case, we are quite lucky. I'll get back to that in a moment. So what happens here is that for the first third of the iterations, it just converge, it just does the exact same thing as before. All parameters are left in. Then from iteration 17, in this case because we're 50, until, well, the f yes? Can you explain what the penalty is? Yes, I will discuss that more in a moment. Okay. Um, it's easier when you look at some numbers. Then it will do, use the built-in step function in R. I don't know how many of you have used step in R. Not that many. Okay. <laughs> because that's actually part of the explanation. <laughs> Basically, what it does is that you calculate, when you calculate the AIC, I will, um, Here. This is not my preferred definition of AIC, whatever. Um, AIC is defined as the log likelihood and then a penalty on the number of parameters. And this is not the way to look at it. Um, so when you look at the AIC, this penalty on the number of parameters, you have a penalty parameter that is usually two for the AIC but you can use something different. So whenever you add a parameter, how much should the likelihood improve? That's basically what it means. So here we're using a one. That means that the likelihood should increase. Well, it's allowed to decrease by one. We're doing maximum likelihood. And of course, with all the parameters that we estimate, well, we're not effectively doing maximum likelihood, but we are calculating the likelihood uh, in the optimum which should be close to the maximum likelihood optimum if the algorithm converts to the right point. But we're not doing a maximum likelihood optimization effectively. Um, but when comparing and doing and comparing likelihoods, you have to look at which one has the lowest AIC when you look at that. And then what is how much should the likelihood change in order to select one model or the other model. And using a one, as a penalty to the number of parameters gives you a large model. If you use two, which is the AIC choice, you will get a smaller model, typically. Not always, because it depends on whether there are any parameters to take out in between. But I'll show you the, the test values in a moment. Um, so what happens here is that it removes one variable at a time. And then it refits the model remove any variable, the, the least significant variable is then removed iteratively. And then after having done that until round 34 to two thirds of the iterations, then it just runs out, make that one model converge. So it did converge here. I have one issue with this particular approach here, uh, namely in here, when you take out a parameter, you take out the least significant one, so it should not mean much. But I think you've all seen that when you remove variables from a linear regression model, even though they're insignificant, the other parameters will change, right? At least many of you will have seen that. That also means that in this case, all the other parameters will have changed if it was allowed to converge, but you only take one iteration. Sort of like the initial iterations here are quite I wouldn't say random, but they are varying quite a bit. So 
is not allowed to converge before deciding which variable is next one to take out. So it may not end up actually taking everything out that you wanted it to take out. So I created another function that does this, where it only takes out one variable at a time, allows it to converge, and then look at what should I take out, and so forth. Um, but for now, let's just look at the resulting model. What you'll see relative to before for the AR part is that, well, there's a lot of zeros, or at least some zeros in here that weren't there before. But I think I will rerun it with a penalty of two. And now what you will see, oh, sorry, I will go back and have it as a one. Because I want to show you one more thing. I want to show you the f values, which are effectively the ones that you use to compare when you look at, are these above or below the penalty? So what you look at here for the AR part, the f statistics, for all the remaining parameters here, you get an f value. And then if I now rerun it with a, f, with a penalty of two, if we look at what is the smallest value that I have here, that is below two. And as long as there's something that's below two, I will remove the smallest one. That's the way it works. But it is just like an if statistic that you're doing. You compare two models, and then you're saying with or without this. And well, if you do an F test, what would the critical value be? 3.84. So that's quite different from using both a one and a two. So using a two is probably okay. Now, if we look at this, you have quite a number of values here that are between one and two. So that's why if we rerun it with a penalty of two, and just look at the f values. This time we're lucky. You can say we only, we're left with only f values that are much greater than two. And they're actually for the AR part. And they're also all greater than 3.484. So we will get the same model, no matter what we'll do for this, for the MA part, uh, for the AR part. And if you look at the MA part for the f values there, we see that you get one that is 2.03. So this parameter would have been left out if we had picked a larger if value. But you can also see that actually there are not that many parameters left. So many of the 44, well, we're still estimating the mean values as well. We cannot kind of get rid of those. Well, we can, but we shouldn't. Um, so you can say the, the 40, you can say main dynamic parameters in here. And now we've reduced that quite a bit. And now we're at a point where we actually created a model, and we said that now we sort of trust in the parameters that are left. So now we can start looking at what is actually the inference about this. Because now we use the ARC criteria, so we did actually train the model, and we can look at, in this case, the AR1 parameters. And I think one thing to notice is if we look out here at the last two columns, well, maybe first just looking at the different series in here, how are they related? I think one of the interesting thing is why three, which is the suicide homicide by firearms, doesn't depend on itself the year before. That's nothing. What it does do is it depends on the suicide by firearms and nothing else. Now, the legislation effect only has an implication on Y2 and Y4. Well, so the legislation only has an implication for suicides, not for homicides. So making it more difficult to get hold of firearms doesn't make any difference if you want to kill someone else, only if you want to kill yourself. 
<laughs> That's the hard truth. <laughs> now the and then you can say what is the effect here? Well, there's an increase here. So we actually increase the homicides by firearms, whereas you have an initial decrease of suicides by oh sorry sorry you have an suicide by firearm, you have an initial increase and you stay there and then you for the Y what do I say? Oh sorry. It's the you know, suicide by firearm and then suicide by other means. You have a decrease, but then it increases with time. So you had a protection, but it will kind of disappear after time. Actually, with a lot of things, when you do the, an intervention, it has an immediate effect. And you can lower something, but then it will kind of get back to normal. I don't know how many of you have experienced that. But the question first. The AR, good, good question. It's formulated as a polynomial on the left-hand side. So it's the way that you can say the textbook does, not the R way of doing it. Good question. One thing is, say, the city of London, for instance, they experienced a drop in traffic after they made the payment toll, payment ring, but now it's pretty much back up. Now it's just an added cost of going to work. So a lot of these things, they have a temporary effect that doesn't last so well. So, and if you look at the moving average part of this, again, we see that there's not too much left here. I think most interestingly, Y5, which is Homicide by other means is independent of the others here. Because there's nothing there nor there that is significant that, that is different from zero. Now why didn't I put this into the code? I said I made this stepping slow, which kind of does a step all the time, uh, one step at a time. You take the object, the data, and then I'll just reuse the penalty of two. And I think I did define it. Oops. I'll just source this file. I'll share the code with you so you have it. Um, but it's not what changes the world. Step dot slow, and now I'll just make a new model. SL is step dot slow, and it takes an object, which is a Marima model from previously. It should take the one that is not reduced, so that we can do reduction from scratch. So what we'll use is the Marima tree model. And then we take the same data as was used up here, which is just all data. And what you will see now is that you can say it starts fitting a lot of Marima models, removing one variable at a time. This leaving things out is just because there's something left for the prediction. That So there's no observations out there. There's some NAs out there. I can, while it is running, I can show you that over here. Um, go back. So the last row in the data from 91 up to 100 are NAs everywhere but in the legislation. So what we want to do is to predict up to sort of now what is what is there. If we now look at SL, let me just copy those two. Let 
then we get, you can say, a new set of parameters, and they're not the same as before. Because it's not the same model. Because before, it was doing this stepwise regression where it just removed variables without waiting for it to converge. What is the easiest way to look at this? If you just look at, now we're looking at the AR part. And I'll go back and look at the AR part from the model up here. And now we can see them both. So one interesting difference, in my view, is that for the legislation effect for the Y4, which had a huge negative effect up here, it's gone. Oh, sorry. And now I forgot actually if the sign here, since it's a regression part, I have to think of what the sign actually means here. Um, but what is important is that to notice at least initially is that it's not the same model. Also, this parameter here is not included here. This one is the same way up there. I look at the AR up there. Now I actually get something here, something there. So it's a quite different model. The only difference is that now I actually allowed it to converge before I removed an unsignificant variable. So it's sort of like doing a linear regression where you don't really do the linear the minimization right. You just do the first step in that. I know for a least squares problem, you can do that in one go. But you think of it, you have to do it, as you could see here, you had to take at least 10 steps before it was something somewhere near where it would actually converge to something. So a learning is to allow algorithms to converge. And I have told him like this, and he somewhat agrees, but hasn't changed the code yet. OK. I think I will move on to doing the forecast. And now I'll use the SL model instead of what I prepared. The forecast is basically just doing an armor.forecast. It's the function. You give it the entire data set the way it is here. And you say, well, go for the first 90 steps, go to that filter, and then predict 10 steps forward. So start with 90 and predict 10 steps. And then it produces a lot of output. What I will just do now is to run the code from the example to show you what comes out of it. And I need to make the plotting area a little bit larger. Take the years, take the prediction out from the forecast. Look at the standard deviation from the forecast. We should maybe look at So we have the variables in here in the forecast, the start, how long to start, how far much further, what are the forecast, what are the residuals, prediction variances, and the average values, and the mean pattern so that we can reconstruct everything. And then we will create the upper and lower intervals by using some quantile. We could use the, instead of this, using, say, 1.92, which is Oh, 96, sorry. It's so 962. Uh, and then I will just look at all my predictions here. But I don't want to actually spend much time. I just want to make a plot of the data. So this is just for one of the variables that I'm doing this, suicide by firearms. So those values out there are my predictions. And I can add a prediction interval around it. Which is, and then it's like, now the lecturer is happy <laughs> for one of the parameters. Of course, you could do this for the other three as well. But that's pretty much just copy paste, where you change the index, 
which forecast very, very column do you want? Here I just took the second one, suicide by firearm, but you can do take it and just do it for the third and fourth and fifth one and get something that is quite similar. That was kind of the example I wanted to show, um, discussing a lot of different things, also recapping a few things here and there. Then I have another data set that you'll be working with in a short while. It's related to mink and muskrat skins that are traded in Canada. Back in those years where fur sales was a major industry, it still is, at least in Denmark, but not skins that you get from the wild, which was what you did here. So basically, and muskrat, if you are Danish, it's a bisonrotte in Danish. I know, I think everyone knows what mink is. <laughs> um, so this is where the data set comes from. And the story is, well, if there's a lot of mink out there, they will eat the muskrats. Well, then there'll be less muskrats. Then the muskrats, then the mink will die off. But if there are more muskrats, then because there are not so many mink, they will, muskrat population will grow, and then they'll give you more mink. So you have a loop here where the two populations, they interact because they feed one feed on the other. So it's a predator-prey model. I don't know if you've heard of that in other courses, uh, but it's some of those examples that are fairly neat to communicate. Um, sometimes they're a little bit bloody, but it's... <laughs> what are you saying up there? <laughs> okay. So... Where? Yeah, but I have not gotten... These are, the, these are the data from the original paper for the firearms. So I don't have the, the values after 2004. Otherwise, I would have... I, you could probably get it off the, the net, uh, internet somewhere, but I haven't. Well, I would... I mean, ideally, that's what you should do. You can tell Henrik that. He might find his time to do that in his otium. Um, so the first bit here is pretty much just getting the data. I have uploaded the data in a nicer way for you. So basically what you have is the data that I have now. And if you look at the numbers, you're looking at the mink data and the MOSFET numbers here. And the one thing, when you just look at it, also if you look at the summary of the data, what to notice is that the maximum value down here, if you look at the spread here, it's much higher than you can say the, if you look at the interval, interquartile range in, interval here, then the distance down to the minimum value is not so great, but the distance to the maximum value is much larger. So what is this an indication of? Any quick ideas? Yeah, so there's a, a few points where it got really high, but, it, but there's still also, these extremes will influence our modeling quite a bit. So what I, will, what I will do is to, without further commenting, I will just do a log transformation. It has another <laughs> nice feature, which means that when I do the model after the fact, in the log domain, when I add things, it means that in the non-log domain, I multiply things. And what I want to do for the model as such, for the conceptual model that I have here, I want to have a multiplier on how to get from one, one year to the next. What is the evolution from one year? How is the relation? Um, so I will do the... I'll share this code if I didn't already. Um, and the log transform look like this. You can also, if you look at the data before, you say, it still looks a little bit like the variance is increasing here, but not as much as it was before. Up here, it looks reasonably nice. 
If you look at the autocorrelation function of this data, just zoom in a little bit, what do you see? Well, first of all, you look at the diagonal here, and you see some oscillation here, right? You see a similar pattern down here, and then, of course, in the cross correlation, you will also see some oscillation. If we now look at the partial autocorrelation, what do we see here? Well, effectively much less than before. We do see something in lag 3 over there. We do see something in lag 2 here. And then there are some, you can say, high lags. We see something in lag minus 1, minus 2. So there is something around, but it's not a whole lot around. So we don't need to go for a huge model. Now I could do this using Marima, but I will use some functions in R um, just to do something different and leave the doing the same thing or similar thing in Marima to you. By doing this, I'll also argue why I prefer Marima for doing this. The AR function can fit a multivariate model. The default is to do maximum likelihood. We would want to do that, but it will not do that only for univariate models. So we'll make it do a conditional sum of squares, which is basically similar to what Marima will do for the same thing here. But it will do it automatically. Figure out which one up to a lag to order 10 is the best model. And it comes out and says, well, the best model is an AR five model. And then we have all the coefficient matrices here for this AR5 model. Oops. And there's no summary function that gives you any nice, just you can see what is in there. To see, well, how much better is model five, here are the AICs relative to model five. So model four is almost as good. Any higher order is bad. The very low order is also very bad, but I mean, the improvement here, we talked about before which penalty to use. Here we use the penalty of two, that's the AIC criteria. They're not so much different. If we look at the residuals from this model, in the same way as before, it's quite nice. Nothing really to comment on. Um, there's only one that's here in lag zero. It's a little bit outside, so there's a little bit of correlation left in lag zero. But that's, I mean, not a whole lot. And of course, if there's nothing in the autocorrelation function, there's nothing in partial. You can plot it. And there is effectively nothing there. We should test one way of testing for normality. That's the one. The last slide here for the model validation. In the Marima case, I just showed you one graph there, but of course you should do the same thing for the multivariate setting as you did for the univariate setting. Actually, if you could do sign test, you can do some test of distributions, and you have to look at the cross correlation as well as we just did down here. So, what is it? that we want to do. One thing to test for distribution assumptions is to do the so-called kolmogorov smirnov test for normality. Take the residuals and normalize them by the standard error of the residuals and compare with the, density, the normal distribution. We get a p-value of 0.27, so we cannot reject that it's normally distributed. Neither for the other variable So this was the function AR. The one difference, one of the differences is that, well, we got a fifth order model, but the only way we could check significance is by picking which order that we, that we want. We cannot say that we want some of the, and then we, then we always get a full matrix at the particular order. 
So we got in the output here, many of these parameters are probably not significantly different from zeros. But we just get them because that's the way it is. We cannot choose, we can only choose that we want the full matrix at this lag. There's another library for vector autoregressive models. And if I just fit it, I don't, what it does is actually also doing linear regression models, just as Marima does. It's easier to do for a pure AR model because they can just do it. And here you have the lag one mink, lag one muskrat and so forth, and you get the equation, the parameters down here. It's just like a summary of an LM. And indeed, if you do the summary of this, you get two summary tables from a linear model. And you will notice again here, many of these parameters are insignificant. If you look up here, there's something that's a significant constant. Well, that was the model that was picked, that was the order that was picked just before. So it's not a perfect world. It has a vector autoregressive selection function, so it automatically finds what is the, a good model. And then it will calculate, ah, I'll redo it a little bit wider here. What we get out is the AIC and some other criteria for which model is better. We want to minimize, so for the AIC, the function also helps us a little bit and say which order is giving the best result. So for the AIC, it's the fourth one. The SC is the same as the Bayesian information criteria. And that was actually why I had this web page open. The FPE is the Akaiga's final prediction error. Definition is here, and the HQ is Hanan Quinn criteria. It's not something that is broadly used, but just so that you have now you have words for them. So, but what you will notice here is that the BIC and AIC gives quite different orders, four and one. But we use the type constant. That depends on what is which trend do we want to have. Do we want to have a mean value? That's effectively what we did. Or do we want to do something different? If we now just fit an order one model, which is the best by BIC, then, and to the summary of this model, the nice thing is actually all the parameters here for the muskrat part of the model are significant. And all the mo and for the mink, well, the constant is not significant, but the dependence on the mink and the muskrat the year before, they are significant. So, to get back to the predator-prey part, if the mink population, how is the mink population the year after? Well, a positive value means that you are expanding, a negative value means you, that you are not expanding. So the mink is growing if there's more mink, and it's also growing if there's a lot of muskrat. So that is in concordance with what we expect. Now the muskrat here, what happens there? Well, if there was a lot of mink the year before, there would be less muskrat. Well, that is exactly what we kind of assumed up here. And of course, if there's a lot of muskrat, I mean, they will just breed and there'll be more. So that's also, I expect that that should be a positive parameter. So here we have the negative part from up there, and here we have the positive part going the other way around. And then we have a lot of different tests that you can use in this package. Testing for autocorrelation, basically it's the Popin 2 test or your, uh, young box test that we've used. You can also test for heteroscedicity. Heteroscedicity. It says up there. Uh, heteroscedicity. Basically, is the variance homogeneous or not? I really dislike that word. <laughs> um, 
and we cannot reject that either. For the normality test, well, before we did the Kolmogorov Spinoz test, but there's a lot of other tests. One is a Jacques Barat test. You can also do a test for skewness or and a test for kurtosis. That should be zero uh, if you have true normal. And they are all insignificant just to make things easy. I'll wrap it all in one function and get all the p values out that I care about just to see, well, are there any of those that are below 0 0.05? And, well, they're not. So we're happy. If I plot, ah, this is one of the problems with a small resolution on the screen here. Did not improve much. Basically, the residual plots that you get by default in this package is showing the data along with the fit and then looking at the residuals down here to see if something is odd. You look at the autocollation and the partial autocollation of the residuals for each of the series one by one. So we don't have the cross information here. There is something in lag 10 that is not taken into account. And if I hit enter, I get it for the other model. And it looks, except for the part that is out, here is actually everything is fine. It, it's just sitting on the border there. But I mean, we also expect that there will be some that are out. And this is the summary of this model. Oh, now I want to have it spaced the other way around again. We see that, I mean, this is basically what we looked at before, that it's a nice model. But what you can see as well is the roots from the characteristic polynomial are both equal. But here you do not get the actual value. You just get the uh, modulus of it. If we calculate the values, we get complex roots. So this is also underlying that in an AR vector, AR1 model, we can actually get oscillations. Whereas in the univariate case, as you saw in assignment two, you needed to go to an AR2 model. So you can take an AR1 bivariate model and get the same behavior as you have for a univariate AR2 model. Now, instead of having just a constant, as we did before, you can also have, so a constant gives you either a first or the fourth order model. You can also have a, a global trend in the data. Then you want a, a larger order. You can have a combination of the two, or you can have nothing. And if you then look at the ARC for the various things here, well, you get the lowest one is for both. So we should refit the model. And with both as input here, the best model was, again, from a BRC point of view, was to have an AR1 model. So if you fit that model and look at the summary, yes. None means that you do not estimate. Actually, you can see it. If you do none, you do not have a mean value. So you don't have an intercept. So in a linear regression setting, it's not having an intercept. You can see that in this li li these linear models here, you use the constant level here rather than having the usual intercept term. So that's answering. So what you will see here is that for the Mink model, there is a significant trend, but not, con not a significant level. Whereas for the Moskrat, there's a significant constant, but not a significant trend. And that's why we want to have both in there. One of them wants one, and the other one wants the other. 
And again, you cannot kind of distinguish between the two. In Marima, I could make that model that only had one had a constant in one and a trend in the other. That was basically, I know it was a little bit quick walk through, but it was just to show and motivate in 20 minutes, well, what to do with residuals from models that different estimation methods give you different parameters. And also that even the same model structure in Marima, it depends on how you select variables actually matters. You will not always get to the same result if you do something a little bit different. So you have to pay, pay attention. This is also why for the third assignment, when you're going to select how to select models, you should document why did you do what you did? What was the recipe that you're going to use all the way through? So that's one of the things I think is very difficult for you to assess peer grading wise. It's one part of it, of course. Um, as I said, the rest of it is, is different. Um, but I just wanted to show that a lot of these things, the reason why I, I discuss all those differences is that you will meet them. When you go out and pick an off-the-shelf tool somewhere for doing some modeling, well, you have to kind of know what are the good things about it and what are the challenges about it. The none of these models does a perfect model. The reason why I prefer, prefer Marima is that it actually we get down from these 40 parameters to something that is much less at the end of the day. Um, and I prefer to have patrimonious models where you only have those parts that are significant that are actually in there. Now, the one thing I haven't uploaded yet, but I'll just show you right now. And I will share it in a moment. So this is the questions that I have for Simon Tree. You, I don't know if you can read it from there right now, uh, but I'll just upload this. So please read through the questions. I tried to do what you kind of gave me as information in the midterm. Um, and I hope that everyone who wanted to kind of had an extension got that uh, uploaded because now I will not allow anymore to upload anything. Um, but I will, I will share this and the peer grading will not open until Sunday. But have a look at it today, and then if there are some things that I, you say you want me to kind of look at, you have the window of opportunity right now to give some feedback to, this could be much better if, and then I will consider it. Um, so I, I like to have this window to, to play around with. But I will upload this and my sample solution, um, which is not a solution as such, it's just, some results as previously. Any questions? Yes? Uh, maybe the things you went through in R today, the development and the flows that you also made, do we need an extra package in R to assess them? Because you didn't write the best job this The only thing, wh what I did um, was for Come on. Oh, whatever. Um, the VAS model I did at the end, whenever I say library of VAS, if that is not installed, you just write install.packages, parentheses, and the name of the package. In the Marima example that I've also uploaded, what I usually do when I write my own code is that I write the install.packages command and then I just put a hash in front to comment it out. Because then I can see what I did when I did it the first time. Uh, the VAS model was already installed, so I did not write that command. But that's how I typically leave, leave it there. Other questions? <laughs> 